15 Things You Didn't Know About Tommy Hilfiger. Welcome to Alux.com, the place where future billionaires come to get inspired. Hello, Aluxers. We're very excited to have you with us today as we talk about one of the most groundbreaking fashion designers in history, Tommy Hilfiger. Tommy was born March 24, 1951 as Thomas Jacob Hilfiger in Elmira, New York to jeweler Richard and Nurse Virginia. He was the second born of nine children and was raised a Catholic. Since launching his namesake brand in 1985, Tommy Hilfiger has become globally renowned as the pioneer of classic American cool style. Inspired by iconic pop culture and Americana heritage, the designer and his brand are driven by an ever-optimistic vision to break conventions and celebrate individuality. Today, under Hilfiger's guidance, vision, and leadership as principal designer, Tommy Hilfiger is one of the world's most recognized lifestyle brands that shares its inclusive and youthful spirit with consumers worldwide. In fact, for a period of time, the very colors red, white, and blue were synonymous with the designer. He pioneered courting hip-hop artists in a time before it was common practice, extending his brand's reach even further. If you're new here, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram at Alux. That's enough with the intro. Okay, Aluxers, here it is. 15 things you didn't know about Tommy Hilfiger. Number 1. As a child, he suffered from dyslexia. In an interview discussing his tell-all book, American Dreamer, he elaborated on his childhood struggle with reading. He says he just had to learn how to read in a different way, saying he cured himself. It's not like he took medication or went to a specialist. He says he forced himself to read each word as it presented itself, rather than attempting to speed read like an average person. Number 2. Hilfiger never went to design school. He began experimenting with design in the early 70s. At the age of 18, he opened a store called The People's Place in Elmira that sold hippie supplies like bell bottoms, incense, and records. Wildly successful at first, Hilfiger soon had a chain of stores and a six-figure income, but a downturn in the economy hit his business hard, and he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 1977. That setback only motivated him to work harder. He's quoted as saying, I forced myself to learn the nuts and bolts of the business, and not solely on the creative side. I got hyper-focused on it. I learned how to read a balanced sheet. I figured out how to control expenses and figured out a way to build a business on a shoestring budget. In school, they teach you through case studies of other companies. I had my own case study. Number 3. He was fired from Jordache after only working one year. In 1976, Hilfiger fell in love with Susie Corona, an employee at one of his stores. The couple married and moved to Manhattan shortly after the bankruptcy. They were hired as a husband and wife design team by the apparel brand Jordache, but were fired after only one year. Hilfiger developed a reputation as a hard-working young designer and was considered for jobs at Perry Ellis and Calvin Klein. What he really wanted, though, was his own label. Number 4. He got his chance to launch that brand in 1984. Hilfiger was approached by Indian entrepreneur Mohan Murjani, who was looking for a designer to head a men's sportswear line. Murjani allowed Hilfiger to design the label under his own name, sealing the deal. The pair announced Hilfiger's arrival onto the scene with a blitz marketing campaign that included a bold billboard in New York City's Times Square announcing Hilfiger as the next big thing in American fashion. In fact, Hilfiger told a reporter in 1986 that he thought he was the next great American designer, the next Ralph Lauren or Calvin Klein. Number 5. Tommy Hilfiger has an estimated net worth of $520 million. It was in 1984 when Tommy Hilfiger Corporation was launched. In 1992, the company went public. Hilfiger sales went up and up, from $107 million in 92 to $138 million in 93 and $227 million in 1994. By the mid-1990s, they were close to 500 Tommy Hilfiger sections within department stores. About half the company's revenues came from sales at three big department store chains, Dillard's, Federated, and May. 
Another 15% of sales came from the discount chains TJ Maxx and Marshalls, which sold the outdated stock at lower prices. Hilfiger began opening his own freestanding shops as well, debuting in Stamford, Connecticut and Columbus, Ohio. As of 2004, the company already had more than 5,400 employees and was earning an annual revenue of more than $1.5 billion. However, over time, the company's sales began to decline, which led Hilfiger to sell the company to the private investment firm Apex Partners for $1.6 billion. And in March 2010, he sold Tommy Hilfiger Corporation to the owner of Calvin Klein Corporation, Phillips Van Housen, for $3 billion. Number 6. The first ever Tommy Hilfiger campaign was legendary. The line of Tommy Hilfiger clothing debuted in the fall of 1985 with an ad campaign that featured no clothes but declared that Hilfiger was the designer on par with Ralph Lauren, Perry Ellis, and Calvin Klein. The ads did little more than insert Hilfiger's name in the Pantheon, yet this was somehow effective. The brashness of the strategy attracted attention in the fashion industry and caused comment by Johnny Carson and other notable people. The first ads were centered around New York City, using print and outdoor media. By 1987, the Hilfiger line was attracting more national attention with advertisements in People, USA Today, Newsweek, GQ, Sports Illustrated, and other publications. The entire advertising budget for Hilfiger clothing was only $1.4 million and ads appeared infrequently. However, they sure did make a splash with double page spreads, and because they featured words, logos, or Hilfiger's face and no images of clothes or models, they stood out from other fashion advertisements. George Lois, who helped create the ads for the firm Lois, Pitts, Gershon, Pawn, GGK, claimed in a March 1988 Marketing and Media Decisions article that he could not make Hilfiger's clothes look any better than anyone else's, and therefore the ads sold an idea, and not a particular fashion. According to one survey, after only two years of his ads, Hilfiger had succeeded in convincing 68% of sampled New Yorkers to name him as one of the top four or five important designers. Number 7. He received the title of Menswear Designer of the Year. In 1995, he received the title of Menswear Designer of the Year, which was conferred by the Council of Fashion Designers of America. His once skeptical peers recognized him as one of the best. Hilfiger made a name for himself by prominently putting his name and logo on his clothes and marketing them to urban youth in a way that other American designers had not done. He harnessed a diverse following of consumers with his oversized, street-style sportswear and relaxed all-American style of jeans, khakis, and polos that began to be taken at the end of the 20th century. And to keep that name and logo prominent, Hilfiger invested a great deal in advertising, and the packaging of the product has surpassed any originality in the clothes themselves. He has raised the bar for fashion merchandising and image branding that have come to define American fashion. Number 8. He was a mentor to Sean Combs' brand, Sean John. When Hilfiger was asked if he had any regrets of helping Sean Combs build his business only to have it take away market share from him, he said, I've always been a mentor to younger designers and people who have asked me for my advice. I also think what's meant to be was meant to be. I was happy to help young people who come to me for advice. Many people helped me along the way. Number 9. He briefly shortened his brand name to Tommy Hill. This was back when he first established the company, but his business partner at the time, Mohan Murjani, convinced him to stick with his full surname to stand out in the business. Seems like that was great advice to follow. Number 10. He's been accused of copying Ralph Lauren. From the outset, Hilfiger has been compared to Ralph Lauren. He has been criticized for copying Lauren's preppy style, but gearing his signature red, white, and blue styles toward a younger market at more popular prices. Hilfiger, like Lauren, has appeared in advertisements for his clothing line. Both men have used the American flag as an important marketing tool. Hilfiger has also replicated Lauren's business model, even employing former Lauren executives to help build Tommy Hilfiger, which Hilfiger, with backing from Silas Chow and Lauren Stoll of Novel Enterprises, bought from Murjani in 1989. Chow and Stoll then incorporated Tommy Hilfiger in Hong Kong. Following Lauren's lead-in lifestyle merchandising, 
Hilfiger expanded his franchise by opening a number of stores whose interiors reflect the all-Americanness of his clothing, by signing licensing agreements around the world, and by offering a range of lines such as underclothing, accessories, fragrances, home decor, designer jeans, women's wear, children's wear, and a higher-end menswear collection. Hilfiger spent $15 million in advertising to launch his men's fragrance, Tommy, in 1995, which at the time was the most money spent on a campaign for men's fragrances. That's not bad company for Tommy Hilfiger to want to be in. In fact, if you want to learn some more about his rival, click in the top right corner to watch our video of 15 things you didn't know about Ralph Lauren. Number 11. The brand suffered major declines in the early 2000s. Around the year 2000, his professional success began to dwindle down as he started suffering from financial troubles. His designs started losing their popularity with the hip-hop artists and sales went down by 75%. Tommy may have rested on his red, white, and blue laurels for too long at the time because trendier brands like FUBU dominated urban fashion, while Tommy's clothes filled bargain bins at Bloomingdale's and Macy's. Hilfiger tried a host of makeover strategies that didn't work. A women's sportswear collection failed miserably. Sponsorships of Mary J. Blige and Sheryl Crow concerts didn't sell more Capri pants. And while one of its new fragrances performed well, it didn't turn around the company. Though Hilfiger's impressive growth had slowed dramatically from the 1990s, the company remained a popular and well-known brand. Along with traditional advertising, the company chose to tout its image using unique methods, including the purchase of the sponsorship rights to Long Island's Jones Beach Theater, one of the most successful amphitheaters in the United States, and the sponsorship of a 50-foot sailing vessel. The ship was named the Tommy Hilfiger Freedom America Yacht and would be racing in the challenging 27,000-mile, nine-month endurance alone around race that would launch in New York City in September of 2002. For Tommy Hilfiger Corp, remaining afloat of the highly competitive, ever-changing fashion industry would no doubt prove to be just as challenging. Number 12. Tommy Hilfiger has partnered with supermodel Gigi Hadid. Now going into their collection, the collaboration between these two fashion forces has been a blast. The partnership has been equally beneficial for the both of them. Gigi Hadid may have helped Tommy Hilfiger sell more bomber jackets, sweater, and sailor outfits, but their partnership has apparently also been good for the supermodel. The designer said Hadid's social media following has grown exponentially since joining the brand. Hadid has more than 48 million followers on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook today, more than twice the number she had before their collaboration. Number 13. He is leading the charge of inventoryless showrooms. Located at its global headquarters in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, the digital showroom revolutionizes the sales experience for retailers by offering them a more engaging and seamless buying approach. The interactive system blends collection information, sales tools, and brand content in one seamless touchscreen interface. Hilfiger told The Post that we don't have showrooms packed with clothes anymore. 13 of his 40 showrooms across the world are equipped with the IMAX theater-like technology and iPads that show off his collection to buyers. The centerpiece of the digital showroom is an interactive half-meter by one-meter touchscreen table set in a sleek walnut frame, which connects to a four-meter high wall-to-wall -wall grid of ultra-high-definition 4K screens. Customers can digitally view every item in the Tommy Hilfiger sportswear and Hilfiger denim seasonal collections and create custom orders all with product categories laid out across a single screen. They can view head-to-toe key looks, zoom in with incredible detail to see unique design features, and click on a garment for specific information such as color offerings and size ranges. Tommy Hilfiger said, quote, Our unique digital showroom concept is a juxtaposition of craft and innovation. The platform reflects values which are at the heart of our brand DNA. Entrepreneurial, inspirational, surprising, inclusive, and accessible. We believe this is the sales experience of the future and look forward to working with our retail partners in this exciting new setup. Because who needs a bunch of clothing racks that clog up space anyway? Number 14. Tommy Hilfiger is launching clothing for adults with disabilities. After releasing multiple adaptive clothing collections for children last year, the brand is adding a range for adults. 
37 men's and 34 women's styles with modifications like Velcro closures, magnetic flies, and adjusted leg openings to make it easier for people of all abilities to get dressed. Tommy Hilfiger collaborated with Magna Ready and Runway of Dreams, a nonprofit that works to broaden clothing options for people with disabilities. Number 15. Tommy Hilfiger now serves as ambassador for the brand and doesn't have all the design responsibilities. He's quoted as saying, I'm busier than I've ever been and I'm happier than I've ever been. I don't have the burden of all the day-to-day -day business. I feel that our leadership is better than ever and is as strong as any leadership in the entire industry. Daniel Grider, who's the global CEO, is leading the charge and believes very strongly in social media and being on the edge from a technology standpoint. That is one of the reasons why we've continued global growth. It takes a very special person to have that vision. He's very strong and confident in making decisions that keep us on the edge of technology. Now tell us, Aluxers, where does Tommy Hilfiger rank among your top fashion brands in history? Let us know in the comments section below. And as a reward for sticking with us all the way to the end, of course, we have a bonus fact just for you. Tommy Hilfiger used to hand out free clothing. According to Ralph McDaniels, the creator of Video Music Box, Tommy Hilfiger would show up in predominantly black neighborhoods and open up a trunk with clothes and hand them out. It makes the malicious rumor that the designer doesn't like black people wearing his clothes look even more ridiculous. Hilfiger's shrewd marketing move paid off big time, as people who received free clothing only ended up wanting more of it. McDaniels adds that it was like a drug dealer giving you a free hit. Suddenly, people started purchasing their own Hilfiger, including 90s icons that made the label a staple in the hip-hop community. Hilfiger famously ended up on the backs of 90s stars like Aaliyah, Snoop Dogg, Raekwon, and more. Thank you for spending some time with us, Aluxer. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a video. If you want more, we handpicked these videos you might enjoy, or head over to alux.com for the best in fine living content on the planet. Be a part of the largest community of luxury enthusiasts in the world and tell your story.